control of the weather may not want to go outside or maybe want to the snow. We got some up in Buffalo. Too bad we're not going to get to watch a snow game as they move that to indoors in Detroit. But point of the story, maybe you want to sit back and chat with me. So I'm Mike Osti, and this will be a Mountaineer live chat here. Once again, in the midst of a lot of sports news in terms of West Virginia athletics. So last time I did one of these, W had an athletic director. Not the case now. And of course, I've done other shows and there's tons of our coverage at WV Sports now. But any of you want to chat along and have a conversation, give me your perspective. Tell me why I've been right. Tell me why I've been wrong and what you've been reading and hearing from me. Obviously, Shane Lyons out as a D. What will Neil Brown's future be? That's going to be a major question mark. This team still trying to fight for bowl eligibility. But by the time you listen to this, that may not be a thing if they can't take down Kansas State, who's ranked number 15th in the country. They do beat Oklahoma. That's a big program win. First time in WVU football history. They beat Oklahoma as a Big 12 rival, obviously winning that Fiesta Bowl now. Feels like many moons ago. And Bob Huggins has the basketball team clicking on all cylinders. They are just winning big. They're dominating teams, at least what the scoreboard tells you. But I put up something on WV Sports Now that tells you why Bob Huggins has a reason to be upset with his team, as he is, as he tells us he is. He's not happy at all. They're not even really playing nearly as well as they should be. And some of the reason why they're not even winning bigger than these scores are showing you, and I'm talking 18, 25 point wins is because of mental lapses and missing layups and dumb things that happened last year, but a team with even more veterans and more depth this year shouldn't be doing it. But Perez will be joining in the future. This team might have a high limit if they clean all of that up. So again, feel free to tweet me at Mike Osti 11. You see that below. You see that below. This finger maybe is better to get there that way there. Wherever you are, however you're watching, at Mike Osti 11 on Twitter. If Twitter still exists by the time you watch this or whenever this is over, feel free to send me questions there. Also, feel free to chat along here on our YouTube channels. And we can go wherever you want to go with this. I'm going to start off going on the athletic director direction because my grandfather's funeral was that day, so I wasn't fully a part of that breaking news. Okay, I predict this will be Neil Brown's final game for West Virginia this week. And I got to tell you, before we get into the AD situation, there's no way they're firing him prior to the Oklahoma State game. You guys may want him fired every single week. I'm imagining you maybe wanted him left in in some of these road destinations, maybe Lubbock earlier this season. That's just not going to happen. There's a possibility he's not back next year. Certainly, that's certainly in play. I actually now am almost leaning more of a direction that he might be, although the athletic director being fired, certainly you bring in a new guy, he may want his guy. If you read the tea leaves on the release about the confidence in Neil Brown that, say, Gordon Gee has or anybody with the university may have, it's all saying that we believe in him now, we want to focus with him now, we're all with him now, but of course, we bring somebody else in, they may have a different mindset and obviously neil brown was a shane lyons guy which is why they've been tied to the hip and why neil brown told us he talked to him they had a private conversation he wouldn't tell us what was said but that was a close relationship and i'm sure neil brown saw that as whoa that's probably the end of me around here so i wouldn't be in any way surprised if he's not back next year certainly depending on who they bring in which may come to you in the next few weeks by the way If he is back, I do think it's because the recruiting class is being so solid coming in. And I've talked about this ad nauseum, but a lot of these players want to play for Neil Brown and this coaching staff. And if he's not there, they could lose a lot of kids, even though they say they're locked in right now. And maybe they lied to me. Maybe him being on will be a different story and will change their mind. Who knows? But the one thing that is not going to happen is that he's not coaching Oklahoma State. He's not coaching against the Cowboys. That's just not a classy thing to do with one game left in the season. I get if they lose to KSU, they would no longer be in play for a bowl game or lose bowl eligibility, but they might make him make the decision on JT Daniels, who at that point would be a vet who might be leaving and and, or Garrett Green, or maybe they would tell him what to do, but maybe they'll throw that on him for that final game. And this team at times is playing like they still care about the man. Look at the Baylor game. Look at Oklahoma. Yes, it's been a roller coaster ride and dip after and 
Who knows what team will show up right after that Oklahoma win? Who knows? It could be a totally different story. It could be right back to how they played against Texas Tech. It could be right back to how they played in Ames, Iowa against the Cyclones. Obviously, right before those games, they played well. Looked like they were playing for Brown. Looked like at Oklahoma. We'll see. But that would not be a real classy thing. There was one game left. You're, you're, you know, you're firing him. It is your final home game. You're not leaving him anywhere. But I can't see that out of all things. What I do want to revert back to, though, is the athletic director decision. So some maybe were surprised why the Neil Brown decision didn't immediately follow. Maybe, maybe some of you wanted the Neil Brown decision to happen first. Maybe some of you are more out on Neil Brown than you were on Shane Lyons. And while, I, and I wrote about this throughout the season, I can get being done with Neil Brown. It is his fourth year. This program is floundering. This program did take a dip from last year. And last year was a mediocre bowl loss that took a dip from the year before that finally looked like they were were going somewhere. You don't get the slack that Don Nalen got, the Rich Rodriguez got. This is 2022. You're not going to get five or six years somewhere to turn it around. It just won't happen. Fair or unfair. That's the world we're living in. This is year four. Last year's team was the same team as the year before, and last year's team was worse than the year before. And, And COVID was involved the year before. So... That was less of the situation last year, and the team just played worse. That's more of a hit than this year for me. But you bring in JT Daniels, you do what you think you have to do to fix things, even though you also do lose other players, Mesador, et cetera. Fair or unfair, that does go on Brown. And some decisions, the fourth and one against Pitt, you win that game, you make that call, that maybe changes the whole course of everything. There's a lot of people believe the team was down going into the Kansas State, going into the Kansas game, I, I mean the next week at home. Kansas better. The Jalen Daniels was good when healthy. Yeah, they were flirting with rankings prior to him getting hurt. But you're 13 and a half point favorite. You're at home. You played real well against Pitt despite losing. They should have certainly won that game, especially with scoring all those points. But there are some of my colleagues that believe that once they lost the Pitt, they were bound to lose again because they were just they were just down and the vibe was bad and you scored a lot of points because Kansas defense was bad. And West Virginia's defense was really bad earlier in the year. So who knows if that's the case? I'm not saying I believe it, but if that's the case, that's on Brown. And there's been things that you certainly can point to. And again, it's year four. You got to stabilize yourself for conference realignment. You got to make the program look as good as it can. Having a coach that you feel like is dead man walking. How is he going to go into future recruits? If I'm telling them I'm in my last year or they clearly think you're on the hot seat or they're you know, listening to like Hosty or reading WV Sports Now or anywhere else, continuously talking about the coach's future and all these guys' future. I get it. It's hard. So maybe you want to bring in a new guy and at least have a period of time that you know you'll have some stability. But the buyout's really, really high. A lot of these coaches, some people want, say you freeze, for example, they're thrown out there all the time by some. A lot of money that'll have to be paid there, plus the buyout. I don't care if boosters involve themselves. It's a lot of money both ways. And Shane Lyons is still going to be owed about $4 million. So Lord help us in terms of the money that West Virginia University is going to have to be throwing out there. And if you have a kid going to the school there, I wouldn't be shocked if tuition somehow increases, even though it's not supposed to be a, a direct correlation, obviously, between education and athletic department. So I can understand being out on Neil Brown and being out more on Neil Brown. But Shane Lyons, to me, was more of the problem that needed to be removed. And this is what some others talked about. This is what Pat McAfee talked about. Shane Lyons is the guy that put you in this situation with Neil Brown. Shane Lyons is the guy that awarded, and I want to say awarded, Neil Brown a contract extension for more money and a buyout that treats him like he's freaking Nick Saban after two years and a mediocre bowl win. Yeah, and I'll get to Bob Huggins in a moment here, by the way. I'm happy to have some basketball conversation as part of this. They play coming up. They've been winning, and they look good, even though they had certainly made some dumb mistakes all the way through. So that might be a way to have this be a basketball school again, and maybe Huggins will save you and rejuvenate that program, which hasn't been great. Only one conf- only one tournament win in the last several years, and certainly last year, not good at all. But it certainly looks like it's headed in a much better direction thanks to the transfer portal than the football program. Back to football, though, for a moment. Again, Shane Lyon's more of the problem for me because he awarded Neil Brown – the big money, the big extension, all the security of that buyout. And the buyout is part of this. I just brought it up. 20 million, 16.7 million if they would do it at the end of this season. That's a lot. It's a lot on a buyout. 
And I get it's a major, major program, but my Lord, again, there's, there's a lot in a buyout. When you got to hire somebody else as well, you're going to be looking at the staff as well. You're paying Shane Lyons, which isn't factored in. And I in no way would blame Neil Brown if he wants to take every bit of that. I'm not in any way. I know some out there are saying if he really cares about West Virginia, if he sticks to what he said a few years ago when he was crying and saying he'll bring him back to glory, that he should just give up the money. He should just quit, resign, and not take the buyout or else work out a deal and get a lower buyout. Why? When, when someone offers you tons of money and you sign the dotted line, it doesn't matter whether you're qualified, good enough, or whatever. If somebody right now calls me and say, Mike, you can be the WVU head coach for $4 million, well, WV Sports now, I'm gone. And by the way, I'm not a coach. I'm not qualified to do so. But I'm going to take the cash, and I'm going to give it a whirl. And then I, when I lose and they fire me, I'm going to take whatever I'm owed because that's the way business works. If you don't think this man is worth it, don't offer him the money. If you offer him the money, you got to eventually realize that he's certainly going to take it. And then if things go awry and it doesn't work out, you're going to be on the hook for, for this X amount of dollars. So I don't in any way begrudge Neil Brown. His agent and him, they got the W over Shane Lyons. I'm sure he loves Shane Lyons. Shane Lyons gave him a lot of money and a great opportunity at, at a major university to step up his game in terms of his career. But he's going to get all of that. If I'm him, I, I would. Uh, he'd be a nice guy. He's a really, really nice guy. He is honestly a nice guy. So maybe he would try to work something out and not. But again, I don't begrudge him if he tries to drain every penny out of that thing. And that'll absolutely create a problem here. And it's because Shane Lyons gave it to him. And I get, I know, there were some rumors of South Carolina in particular, of Auburn in particular. And I think South Carolina more in particular of having interest in Neil Brown because he was a young up and coming coach who had a group of five success. People thought, okay, that could translate. This is a reasonable step up for him. Yes, he loved being at West Virginia and was already having a relationship with Don Nalen, but hey, maybe we'll give him more money and he'll jump ship to us. The cupboard was bare year one off Dana Holgerson leaving, not much other players leaving and things nobody could do anything about. And okay, year one, nobody cared about, but year two, all of a sudden, despite COVID going on, and not really a system that was garnering to make sense for what he did at Troy. And all of a sudden, he gets him into a Liberty Bowl victory. A, a, it's not a major bowl game, but it's a reasonable bowl game with some history. We're not talking about a cheese at bowl here. So a Liberty Bowl win over a solid Army team. Who knows if they would have beat Tennessee, because remember, that was the original opponent. And then COVID and other things forced it to be Army. They, they put Army in the game, which Army deserved to be there and get a bowl that year. But they won. And that's something. And that was giving you hope there's reason for the program to be climbing and give you excitement for the next season. Unfortunately, the next season was worse. And the next season, they went six and seven, lost the mediocre bowl game. So he did get another bowl appearance, but it was the guaranteed rate bowl. They didn't show up in the game. They, they had different situations that basically told you they weren't going to win that game. They didn't look good all year. It was a six and seven year, including the bowl game, but it felt like they won three games. They weren't even entertained to watch, to be completely honest with you. And then you go into this year, obviously, it's year four, a new QB. You divorce yourself from the guy that you thought he was too loyal with in terms of Neil Brown and Jared Daigie. He's gone, despite him having eligibility left, by the way. And then you lose other players, but Dante Stills is still around, and it doesn't work out. You feel like you upgrade at QB, but I don't know if the year is any better. In fact, it felt worse at times. It's a roller coaster ride as well. But again, you're in this pickle now with Neil Brown because of the money that was awarded by Shane Lyons. So he loved Neil Brown. They're close. He was already there. He brought him in. That was his first real big coach hire that he was tied with and one mediocre bowl win. And I get it. You don't want to lose him to South Carolina when you think you're riding high two years in. I get it. But you would have been better off to lose him then and then have to retool a couple years later without being screwed financially than have to retool a couple years later, four years into one man, feeling like the program's not any better off and you are screwed financially. So I get not wanting to lose him then, but doesn't mean you got to get stupid with an extension and a buyout. And that's basically what happened. And it, it, it was a death nail for Shane Lyons. And I don't want to get into this now because I'm annoyed by the conversation too. And it's been all over Twitter. I've talked about it all over Twitter. It's on our site. It's been on past shows. I do think Shane Lyons, maybe thoughts of grandeur from Alabama or whatever. And I know Oliver Luck did this first. So he kind of perpetuated it and just increased it from Luck doing it. But made made the schedule too damn tough. I don't think he won any of these battles with any of these other rivals or other other schools on the phone in terms of putting these games together. It's really cool to play Pitt. It's really cool to play Virginia Tech and Blacksburg, even though of course they're not any better than you right now. In fact, they're a down program, but they weren't when you made the phone call. 
it's kind of cool to play Maryland, even though I've argued that that's not real much of a rivalry. Uh, you know, give me a point of, of contention that, that mattered in 50 years, and I'll try to have a conversation with you about it. But but there is none. I mean, it's a if it's a rivalry, it, it's it's one of the worst in, in college sports of that period of time. And some there's no real hate there. But it's cool recruiting wise, and I, it makes sense to play it. Penn State, that's going to be cool. I'm going to love going there to cover a game there, and I never thought I'd be able to cover a game there unless I covered a Big Ten team. So that's cool. And I know the the you know olden days had a rivalry there. I know they 80s and being mad at Joe Paterno, I, I get it, and him stopping that. But and then Alabama coming up in the future, Alabama coming up, and it's not one game. You're looking at multiple games against Alabama. That's multiple losses against the Crimson Tide. And when you played them years ago with Clint Trickett, it was close. It was competitive. Nick Saban praised the West Virginia program by being a native son. And it didn't help anywhere. They didn't go anywhere. It didn't do anything for the program. It's a moral loss. I mean, I get you want to have a solid strength of schedule, but when you already have several ranked teams in conference, looking at this year in the Big 12, all these ranked teams, all these teams are bowl eligible this year, a lot of parity. You could lose any game. You could win any game. But there's ranked teams in there, okay? You're going to play a couple coming up here. You're going to play one coming up here in Kansas State. You got ranked teams on the schedule, and you're at least looking at two or three most seasons, even if they lose or go back in and out of those rankings throughout portions of the season. And of course, TCU being the best team you played all year, they're a playoff team right now. They were on your schedule. So in conference, you had a playoff team on your schedule that you played well against, and that did beat you. But that's a top five ranked opponent that will potentially end the year in the playoff on your schedule, just off the conference. So you don't need to, to add in and stack Alabama. Imagine if that happened where you have a big 12 team fighting for the playoff in the same year as you're playing Alabama. You'd have two teams in the top five, 10 playoff contention. Obviously, the playoff will be increased by then. Come on. That's too tough. Uh, and I, you gotta, again, I, I've been on about this and I, I wrote about the expectations at WVU. And they can open up when you have a 12 team playoff. I get that. It can open up. You got to have enough wins, though. You need a strength of schedule that's tough. You got to have some quality wins. You can't have a UCF 2017 schedule where you play one you know, top 15 team all year. But West Virginia got several of those in conference. Multiple of those this year will be played. They'll play multiple top 15 ranked teams when the game is played this season in conference. You don't need to add any more out of conference. And of course, the rival games are really, really cool because you have no rival in your conference. But, and again, I'll get to basketball here and Bob Huggins in a moment. I think that's maybe more exciting than what you want to talk about, what I want to talk about as well. But just to wrap up here with football, but you have all those conference, you have all those conference games, all those ranked opponents there, all those tough games. You're throwing up real, really tough out of conference games that are just unnecessary to you in the future. And then your rivals that you're playing out of conference is cool to have them. It really, really is. But to play so many of them and multiple of them on the road in the same season, just asinine. On the road at Pitt, on the road in Blacksburg this year, same year. Multiple years in a row, three straight years, not at home against Maryland, not at home against Pitt, not at home against Penn State. None of these are at home. On the road, on the road, and on the road. How are you doing, Joey? Several years in a row, starting a season on the road against an out-of-conference major opponent that you certainly can lose to. You lose to Maryland, you lose to Pitt, you're probably going to lose to PSU. So you're looking at all those being losses. <laughs> I see playing them. I see playing one of them a year. I'd want to play one of those rivals a year. Okay, it can be Pitt. It can be whoever. I would want to play one of those rivals a year, throw one of those group of five teams in as another major a major opponent, maybe out of conference major opponent. Make it a group of five, though, or have it be a lower level team, but not FCS, and then the other one be an FCS. So out of conference schedule should be one legit rival, FCS, Towson or whoever, and yeah, beat up on Towson, and then maybe a group of five or a lower level major conference team. And then you get into the conference schedule and you're still going to have three or four ranked teams on your schedule per season. And that'll be quality opponents. It'll be good enough. It's not going to be murderers row, but it'll be good enough. And if you win 10 games, you could slide into a top 12. You certainly would contend in your conference. If you win eight games, because you got all these tough games on the schedule and you got Alabama there, who you're going to lose to, even if it's competitive, you're going to be, you're going to be having some troubles. You're not going to get in with eight wins, nine wins. Probably not going to be enough, even if you say, okay, I got nine wins, but I played real tough against Alabama, and this other team beat somebody else that's not as good at Alabama. They're not going to care. They got more wins. 
Strength of schedule absolutely matters. It really, really does. It should. But you also got to have enough wins, and they're stacking the schedule too tough. So the death nail of the schedule, the death nail of the, of the freaking buyouts to Adrian Neal Brown, that was the death nail of Shane Lyons and put all those nails in his coffin as he's out as AD. Tons of names. Out that There's even been rumors of Oliver Luck doing it as a bridge for a couple years. Someone brought up Mike Carey. I don't see that. Obviously, he's loved at West Virginia. It kind of was ousted unceremoniously, despite what he did for the women's basketball program. That's just not going to work. I don't see. I know Pat White put out some comments there. Um, you, I think you mean Oliver Luck when you're saying the schedule goes back to Shane. Shane, obviously, the most recent who just got fired. Yes, I know it goes back to Oliver Luck. The portion of the rivalry goes back to Oliver Luck. Playing Alabama multiple times in a row when the playoff's going to be extended and you're going to have Pitt back on the schedule is, is Shane Lyons. Right when you're getting Pitt back on the schedule and the playoff's going to be expanded to where you might have a better chance of getting in, you throw an Alabama on the schedule back-to-back -back years. So you're losing a game built in before the season starts those years in a row with the rival game, with the Big 12 schedule, all of that is going to be rough. Like, hey, Paul, what's going on here? I'm assuming you meant back to Oliver. But again, and I know Matt Matt Borman, who, who was brought up by Pat White, it's interesting to me how well they know each other because Pat was basically leaving Morgantown when Matt was kind of starting his career. I know obviously he was, he was a student and had a master's as well. He's done a lot of great things at LSU, does a lot of things in terms of the Mountaineer Club and then the Tiger Club or whatever the hell it's called. He does a lot of things to try to bridge the gap back to alums, which I think that's one thing Neil Brown has done really, really well is bring in the relationship back, or at least fixing what Dana Holgerson had. Now, some argue not enough, obviously. Pat McAfee saying he doesn't have much of a relationship with the program. Rasheed Marshall told me he doesn't get asked about what any decisions should be made, even though he's welcome back there. So uh, some, some have brought up, you know, others. But I think Matt's an interesting guy. I know when I talked with a rival colleague, uh, meaning a colleague of a, who's a fan of a rival team and kind of covers a rival team, um, you know, he, he was kind of, his eyes got open, like, wow, that would be really impressive if West Virginia got Matt Foreman. So he's thought of as really, really high around the country that resume is there so we'll see that's gonna that's gonna happen soon probably soon after the season does end um gavin and i'm gonna flip to basketball now by the way at mike Osti 11 there on twitter if you want to tweet me want to follow me after this if twitter still exists who the hell knows again at wv sports now for our site for our coverage both basketball football and everything else we got a women's tournament or we got the women's team in the ncaa tournament so maybe it's a women's soccer team school right now um obviously many other programs are still actually doing well even though the basketball and football programs dipped the last few years, to say the least, under Shane Lyons, and that's where the money is. That's why he's out. But right now, WVU is a women's soccer school, so they're in the NCAA tournament right now. Feel free to go to our site for our game coverage there. They're playing at Penn State, Big 12 champs, so they got a championship nonetheless what they do in conference play. The women's basketball team looks really, really good as well under Don P in a new era of women's basketball. We'll see what they do in conference play as well. Um, okay. W smoked Oklahoma like Hunter. By, okay. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of that, but I, again, they played, look, I don't think they, sm they won. It was a big win, but remember they lost the turnover battle. Okay. They lost the turn. Garrett green obviously came in there and sparked them, but they lost the turnover battle and they won. And it made, it was a nail biter at the end. I don't need to smoke anybody. Oklahoma is not nearly what they used to be. This is not a great Oklahoma team. So this isn't the same as if you would have beat Oklahoma with the top save on Austin game where he, they lose 50, 49 and he puts all those all purpose yards. Or if you would have beat Oklahoma even last year in a close game, or even a few years ago, they've been competitive at times and haven't got a win prior to this season. But this is by far the worst Oklahoma team of the last 20 years, certainly since West Virginia has been in the big 12. So you get a win over Oklahoma. It's big for the program to get that freaking over with, but there's no reason to pop champagne. Oklahoma is just not good this year. Um, I do want to get over to the Bob Huggins would be exposed if, because we're talking the football team schedule maybe being too tough for who they are, especially out of conference. Gavin, I'm going to disagree with you there, man. I don't think out of all the things you can criticize Bob Huggins for, and he's a Hall of Famer, a basketball Hall of Famer. We're not talking about, you know, WVU Sports Hall of Fame, which he'll get in. But he's now a basketball Hall of Famer, the Nate Smith Hall of Fame. We're talking everything. He's there, deserving. He should have been in years earlier. 
because they put in coaches during their career. They want them to be able to be at the ceremony. They don't want them to already be dead. And a lot of coaches go until the 80, 70 plus years old. So I don't think Huggins will, but Huggins is in, should have been in years ago, 900 plus wins. Who knows? Maybe he'll finish with a thousand, multiple final fours, sweet 16s, elite eights. Did it at Cincinnati, Kansas State, and WVU as his main places. Obviously a little bit, you know, was at places prior to Cincinnati as well. But those are his, those are his main three core in terms of major programs. He won most of his games and he put Cincinnati on the map. Okay, yeah, Kenny Martin was there, but he got hurt in that tournament, and he put him on the map. Kansas State had one of their better seasons they hadn't had prior to Huggins with Huggins, and they definitely didn't want him to go anywhere. He couldn't, obviously, turn down a chance to go home, go back to Morgantown. He brought WU to their best season since Jerry West, took him to the Final Four for the first time since the 50s with Jerry West. And even though they've claimed the NIT title is now a national title from the 40s because that was the better tournament then, so okay, that's a national championship. They run her up with Jerry West. And then the next best season is Deshaun Butler and Bob Huggins, 2010, winning a Big East, a gauntlet of a tournament that it was. And he was only there a few years. So maybe that early career, early tenure, incredible success at that point, getting there in 07 and that happening in 2010, made people a little spoiled. But the best tenure for really WVU basketball over a decade is still this, even though the last few years haven't been great. Got McBride into the NBA. A lot of players who weren't supposed to be great. Obviously, Javon Carter, who's having now tremendous success in the NBA with injuries going on with the Bucs and getting some playing time, almost 40 points. Not too long ago, a few days ago, about a week ago. So that's all Huggins. And he got and, and in Sweet 16s, it's not like it's just a Final Four and they never get in the tournament again. Was runner up to Kansas in a gauntlet of a Big 12 before in the, in the Big 12 tournament. Who knows about the future? Sweet 16, otherwise... Yeah, it's only one tournament win the last few years, but and that included a COVID season. And last year was really, really bad, and it can't happen again. He's now acclimated to the portal. And, yeah, there's things to criticize him for. He was very resistant to the portal right away. Sometimes he's stubborn. Um, you know, sometimes things don't go his way, and sometimes I don't know if he – not every decision's perfect, and not every coach is going to be perfect. Not every coach is going to be winning all the time. He's not Teflon but he's a Hall of Famer. He's a legend at the school. He's not going anywhere. The school's not going to get a better coach than him after him in terms of legendary legacy. There's a reason why he's going around with other coaches who have won national title, and he has not, unfortunately, in terms of promoting the conference and whatever in college basketball prior to the season starting because he's a freaking Hall of Famer. And, and the overall career is just as good as many coaches who are in. John Chaney was in before him. He had a worse resume, less wins, less tournament success, all that. And it took Huggins forever to get in. I don't know if it's a personal thing or what. Jay Bill has talked about how it was insane that it took him several years. So Huggins is in. He deserves to be in. He's not going anywhere. He usually gets the most out of his kids. He really, really does. You can point to the Oscar situation. Maybe he's too stubborn. Maybe that cost him Oscar Shibway. Who knows? But again, it feels like now he's okay with going to the portal. He's regrouped and he's okay with being in the portal and it's the new system. And out of all things you can criticize Huggins for, now he's trying at the portal. He's created depth. He's improved the team. We'll see about conference play. And maybe stubbornness has been a problem. I don't think schedule is, though. Okay? That's where I'm going to go ahead and disagree, Gavin. He got on the phone and wanted to play Gonzaga. Obviously, you don't have to play Gonzaga. They're well out of conference. And who knows about, you know, if they come to the Big 12. And it'll be tougher when they do, by the way. They'll have more ranked teams. Better teams are playing game in, game out, not just occasionally, even though they'll still be very good. But he's the reason why they played Gonzaga. He played Gonzaga. He wanted to play Gonzaga. Not every coach in the country is going to make that phone call. They want to be scared of Gonzaga in a way. He wants to play them. He wants to get in tournaments that if you win, you can get to Gonzaga again. He's not afraid. They're going to play Auburn this year out of conference. I know it's at home, but they're going to play out of Auburn. Why would you turn down Auburn coming to Morgantown and say, no, I'd rather go to you? No, you're going to play Auburn. Uh, started the season as a top 15 team. That's that's going to be uh, that was a tough game to schedule. They're going to be coming to Morgantown. And the other thing that I'm going to defend West Virginia basketball on in terms of scheduling, like I said, with the football program. Is you have enough ranked teams in the conference. You got Baylor as a recent national champion, Kansas as a freaking blue blood that any season they could go ahead and go make a final four. No one was surprised. And any season they're likely to win the Big 12. 
in any season, they're very, very good. Texas beat Gonzaga. They're obviously very, very good this year. Texas Tech is always pesky and can be a tough team to play. Uh, right now, three, four teams are already mentioned in just Oklahoma occasionally does it in the Big 12 and can be competitive. Guys, there are several. The Big 12 is basically the toughest conference in the country right now. You could argue the ACC in the past when Duke and North Carolina were both really, really good and elite programs. It's not the case really right now, okay? You could certainly argue the Big Ten at times with Michigan, who now has already appeared vulnerable, obviously with Izzo at Michigan State, obviously Ohio State. You know, freaking Penn State actually looks like they might finally be competitive for the first time in really forever. And, and Wisconsin has had deep tournament runs in the last five years, obviously, getting to that runner-up finish. You could argue the Big Ten. <laughs> Historically, obviously, Indiana's there, but it's been a while. But the Big 12 right now is the toughest conference in the country basketball-wise. Several ranked teams are there. They're going to be in a gauntlet in a row. You will play them home. You will go to their place and play them on the road. It will not be easy. You will lose some. You will hopefully win some if you think you're going to add it to your resume and have those be quality wins. If you lose, they'll probably be quadrant one losses, quadrant two at the worst, because, again, you're likely entering those games with those teams ranked. You're going to have Baylor, Kansas, and Texas that are very likely all going to be top 15 ranked opponents that you will face this year. Again, Auburn was 15th coming into the season, and that's an out-of-conference game. You don't have to play them. So the early season run here is an easy schedule. The backyard brawl is cool to have back. You can always fit that rivalry in in basketball. It's easier to do a basketball schedule than football. But Pitt's not good. Pitt's not making that game look that impressive that you kicked their butt. Yeah, Pitt getting their butt kicked by everybody, honestly. And I didn't think West Virginia would beat Pitt by that bad, but we've seen how bad Pitt really is now. So when they lose to VCU, you beating them by 30 or 25 or whatever it was doesn't really, you know, add that much to it. But you still you still kick their butt. You don't make it close. You didn't you didn't linger around with them. It was a rival. You went in their place. It was a tough place to play. I was there. The, the Oakland Zoo was rocking. Haven't seen that from the Oakland Zoo in a long time. More media than you ever could imagine for a pit game in recent years as well. And yet West Virginia got got it done. So that's not a conference game that's quality. Same with Auburn. And you got a lot in conference. You got Xavier two out of conference. You got Purdue, which is not going to be easy. That's out of. I mean, the schedule is not incredibly cupcake city at all. There are some really easy games in there, but West Virginia. It's not the toughest schedule of anybody in the country. But for what West Virginia was last year, how bad they were for what they're supposed to be this year, where people are putting them in the middle of the pack, it's a reasonable schedule. It really, really is. And you're going to lose some games, but if you can win 18, 19 games out of that, you're a tournament team based on how quality those wins would be, and he had enough of them in conference play every year that I could even argue they're making the basketball schedule too tough. So, no, out of all things you want to criticize Huggins for, maybe stubbornness, maybe he's getting a free pass for the last few years, whatever you want to say, the schedule and the fact that he wants these out-of-conference games, including Gonzaga especially, and got on the phone to play them, not 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 a knock on him. Schedule-wise, Huggins is getting it done. The team's getting it done. They're, they're certainly testing themselves. Um, basketball is looking pretty solid this year. Okay. Maybe if Huggins coaches 40 more years to finally get his championship for some bizarre reason. And, and I could, I don't know, Gavin, I'm going to ask you, maybe you want to throw in your, your answer here. If you're a West Virginia fan or, you know, again, here at sports. Now we do have more than just West Virginia's networks we're covering. Maybe you're a pit fan, maybe somebody else, because I cannot imagine a West Virginia true fan would be this upset at Huggins and would hate Huggins this much. If you require a national championship to be won in terms of saying someone's a legend or a Hall of Famer, you are, sir, very unreasonable to say the very, very least. There's a reason why he's so respected. And say if you're a Pitt fan, Jeff Capel really respects him because of what he's done overall. The only reason Jim Beheim has a national title is because Carmelo Anthony, who is the greatest freshman of all time and a basketball Hall of Famer, the ninth leading scorer in NBA history, was at Syracuse. You take the 2003 season away, you take Melo away, and Jim Beheim doesn't have a ring. Would you be hating Jim Beheim and saying he's not a Hall of Famer? Come on. 
And okay, you if you I didn't look at the rankings, but it's a tough schedule. It's a tough conference right now. So yeah, uh, Paul, uh, it, there's nothing to be be upset or sneezing about this schedule or this conference this year. You could argue, and maybe we'll have arguments at different points of this season, depending on what the Big Ten does, or if the AC can ever ACC can ever get back to Duke, Duke and North Carolina dominating the conference and being those top 10 ranked team, both in the same conference, at least it being top heavy and, and Virginia as well, et cetera. Sure. But West Virginia's schedule is definitely not an easy one. It's hard on face value to believe that's the toughest schedule for anybody in the country, but I'll believe what you're saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're looking at Xavier Purdue, you're looking at Gonzaga likely. I mean, this is also figuring you're playing some teams here, depending on how tournaments work out. And then you have all those ranked teams in conference play. So there's cupcakes in there. Yeah, I mean, and more has stayed. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, Mount St. Mary's. Yeah, I mean, these Moorhead, Moorhead was a recent tournament team and they played you in a tournament. So it's not like it, the schedule's not a problem. And to say that Huggins has to win national title, that, that's crazy. Um, Joey, yeah, okay, absolutely. Glad for you to join me. See you, man. Uh, appreciate the compliment there. Um, what about Mark Few of Gonzaga? What did you mean there? Um, yeah, Mark Few of Gonzaga hasn't won a national title either. If that's what you're talking about. Yeah, he got close, finally got close, got into the game, the deep runs, but has not won a national title either. Is he crap? No, of course not. Um, Yeah, Gavin, that's not in any that doesn't make any sense. Pat McAfee has no personal problem with Bob Huggins. Bob Huggins, I've been around him personally. Have you ever been around him personally? I highly doubt it. In no way is Bob Huggins treating people like crap in terms of Pat McAfee. He treats me with respect, and I it deserve to be treated like crap. Or we're talking about ranking people of note. There's no reason why Bob Huggins would respect me and not respect Pat McAfee. That makes no sense. But in person, he's very, very nice. And yeah, maybe he's a little sorely, and I can see him being a little um, you know, aloof at times. Sometimes he does come off a little rude uh, in terms of just being so, you know, laissez-faire, like that was kind of a stupid question. But uh, again, Bob Huggins is treating me with respect and not Mac Pat McAfee. That makes no freaking sense. But again, the reason, and I won't talk about this if you want, Pat McAfee doing a video, a hype video for Texas, okay? And it was Texas basketball. I feel like people are, are acting like this is Texas football. It was Texas basketball. I get it doesn't look good, okay? I didn't find it to be as disrespectful as a lot of fans did. I'll tell you why. Number one, Pat McAfee doesn't have a rivalry with Texas. Pat McAfee didn't play Texas. I get if you're still a fan of the program for all these years, then that would make sense to hate Texas if you're Pat McAfee. But it's not Pat McAfee's fault that he was basically, you know, ushered away from the program. After 13-9, the man admitted he almost committed suicide. He was so hated by a lot of Mountaineer fans. I know what happened at his parents' house in Plum and what went on for a long time. So they were basically, you know, stalked. So to say that he was treated well would be not correct. <laughs> uh, the fans did not in any way treat him well for a long period of time. He wanted to come back sooner, didn't feel welcome because of Dana. Uh, again, now you want to talk about a guy treating people well. A lot of former players have told me they did not feel Dana Holgerson treated them well, and they did feel they didn't want to come to the program while Dana was there. Once Dana was gone, Neil Brown in particular immediately caught, called Pat McAfee, got him back there. And Shane actually was involved in that as well. They That was a whole TV thing on the national TV game. They wanted it to bring Pat McAfee back. Same thing with Rashid, same thing with a lot of other players. And they have done that. Major Harris's number is going up there. And obviously that was retired. So that's at the stadium. Th those things. That's all the Neo Brown era. Dana, I don't think, would have wanted those things to go down. So maybe you can point to Dana. But in terms of Pat McAfee having a problem with Bob Huggins, that just doesn't make any sense. That's not why he's doing it. He, got, I'm sure he got paid for the hype video. Maybe not, though. He is friends with the Texas head coach. But regardless, he said we in the video, guys. Not because now he's a Texas fan, because he's doing a video for them. What's he going to say? I? What's he going to say? You? Like, he's not going to say he's a West Virginia guy in a hype video for Texas. It was a hype video for Texas. And he's working as a media member now. He doesn't work for West Virginia. West Virginia's not asking him decisions. And you could argue they should. 
you could argue they should hire him for something. I don't know if that would work now with him having more of a media career now. But I don't think it's been right by the program to distance themselves from Pat McAfee or any other notable alum. There were a lot of great ones, okay, that are not far, that are very vocal in media. Pat, you know, Pac-Man Jones is another one, even though maybe you'd be scared what he's going to say. He's out there. He actually has a Believe, Believe Network podcast just like I do. So these guys, maybe they should be more involved. Rasheed Marshall lives in the same neighborhood I do uh, in the suburb of Pittsburgh, and he's an hour away, and they didn't want to bring him back there for a decade. That's insanity, okay? That's crazy. So was, Major Harris should have had that number retired years earlier. There's really no reason to wait, okay? Forget what happens in the pros. Waited at college is all that should matter when you're talking about a college number. Pat White's number should be up there, too. Doesn't matter what happened with the Dolphins in the NFL. We're talking about college. That's that's why you get it. it. It shouldn't matter the NFL. It's a different thing. So I think a lot of those things have been handled wrong. And, and for many, many years. And prior to Shane Lyons, prior to Neil Brown, prior to Dan Holgerson, a lot of those decisions, I think they were wrong. But that's not – Pat McAfee's not sticking it to West Virginia to do a hype video with Texas. And I don't think Bob Huggins has anything to do with it. Um, Pat Ma Pat Mack is a national name now in sports. He's doing it to spread his popularity even more. It's just business. Yeah, I'm I'm more in that direction. I mean, I, I don't know if we got money or not. I, I think he probably did. The guy gets paid for everything he does. Like, you know, why do you think I haven't had him on? He, you know, he gets paid when he, you know, he, he's not a he's not a, a cheap guy. He's a high priced commodity to get him on. Is it really worth it to you to put him on? Is what you got to think about. And and that's no knock on him. He's a businessman. He's probably the most successful. In terms of media, not obviously playing. Granted, the playing career was fine. He's actually nominated for the Pro Hall of Fame, even though I don't think he's going to get there. But he, he retired early to embark on this media, media career. He went to Barstool right when maybe he was criticized, but that was very smart because it built up his platform. Then he's now on his own. Millions upon millions are watching that YouTube show. Getting on game day is incredible for his career. Still having the WWE contract is incredible for his career. And just everything else he's doing. Just everything else, because that's not even the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah, in terms of former college player, maybe player in general, in terms of a media career, Pat Mack is probably going to end up being the go to that thing. And I know there are a lot of them. Troy Aikman maybe is someone we could talk about because he's been doing color commentary with Joe Buck forever. Now I'm running at football. But Pat Mack, right up there, right up there. I mean, he's having a great success. In terms of current former player who's involved in college football media now he has the biggest platform of them all that's why i asked neil about his comments that's why they were relevant and that's why it sucks when he's talking down on your program that he played for for so long but the program is down now so that's what he's going to say he's not going to say oh i'm you know rough is going to win every game when obviously they're they're playing poorly what are you going to do um Yeah, the reason why, and I, I, okay, so Huggins blames his players. And I actually wrote about this on the site. The reason why West Virginia fans, to me, the reason why West Virginia fans love Bob Huggins so much is number one, he's brutally honest. Good or bad, he's honest. I think a lot of West Virginia fans, blue collar fans, respect that, okay? Number two, obviously, he's been tremendously successful, and the brand name of freaking Huggins with your school is why there were only two coaches that went to Big 12 media days, and I'm not talking about locally. I'm talking about a national media circus, a media car wash that included going to New York, etc. and it's not the Big East, so they're going up to national media conversation. They're getting on ESPN. Two coaches. One has a recent national championship at Baylor. The other... Bob Huggins. So you're not getting that if, say, whoever is your coach, okay? You got Bob Huggins. You got a Hall of Famer, okay? That's a big freaking deal. Um, And part of his honesty, though, and success, maybe he's been stubborn at time. Maybe the Oscar thing, maybe he's been stubborn at time. Maybe that, you know, I didn't actually think he was going to adapt to the portal as quickly as he did. I thought eventually he would, but this has been really, really quick. And it's because he's willing to adapt to stay around. Okay. But he's really honest when he talks about the schedule and everything. And it's, I think people like that, but it's also truthful this year. This team has been winning big, but they've also been missing easy layups. They've been making a lot of mental mistakes. They went through a three or four possession streak there in the Moorhead State game where they looked like they were, you know, a high school team. 
with mental mistakes. So what is Huggins going to say? He's going to say that, yeah, we're winning big. No, we're not playing good enough. Yes, we've made tons of mistakes. Yes, we should be playing a lot better and winning by more. And we're going to get better because we're going to get Perez and we're going to have Trey Mitchell being better than he is. So I think Huggins being really, really honest, really, really successful. But I like the honesty part more than anything because he's willing to tell you and those players, hey, you're not getting it done. And they know. Eric Stevenson said, I know. We, 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 we shouldn't be missing those layups. They know. Trey Mitchell, no. They all know. They took it on himself. They respect that fan. I don't think they take it as him digging them. It's not like they were playing lights out all the way through. You miss layups. Your coach should say things to you, really. Um, but Huggins takes accountability all the time. So I, again, I, I don't I, to say that Huggins doesn't take accountability and blames his players. The players, are the one missing these layups, is not his fault. These games haven't gone maybe the way you'd want them to the last several years. Honestly, I don't think he had the horses last year. And again, they missed tons of layups. They couldn't rebound at all last year. He had a real problem with recruiting. He had a real problem with the portal. And an Oscar situation screwed him before the year McBride was gone. So going into the year, that was going to be a problem. I didn't think they were going to be good going into the last season. But it got really, really bad. It got worse than it should have been. Seven-game losing streaks shouldn't happen. That's on Huggins. He's the head coach. But he has a track record of success that Neil Brown doesn't have. So he's going to be around. He's going to stay around, obviously. And they're going to give him rope. And this year, looks like it's getting better. It doesn't mean that it's fixed. you got to get into conference play and see what they do against tougher opponents. But the missed layups, you, I have no problem with him bringing that up because they haven't played really, really well despite winning really big. And I kind of like a coach who's willing to be honest and say things like that. Um, I don't think he thought they'd be missing layups, by the way, when he when he brought them aboard. But again, Perez is not yet there. He's probably going to play around conference play. And Trey Mitchell's only six weeks removed from surgery. So this team is not fully who Rob Huggins brought aboard. And Perez might be the even best player, certainly the best shooter there from Manhattan. He brought him over in the portal. He called him 38 times and got him over here in the portal. So once he gets on the floor, if he plays well, that's on Huggins. So we'll see how he plays, but there's no reason to believe he's all of a sudden going to suck after he was good prior. And that is a player brought in by Huggins who will make that team even better. And again, Trey Mitchell not healthy. So there's reason to believe they're going to get even better and there's reason for optimism, but there's no reason why you can be mad at him calling out players for missing layups because I don't care whether you recruit them as a one, two, three, four star or whatever. They should not be missing layups. That's not on Huggins. That's not on anybody else. You shouldn't be missing layups in, in, in that regard. But again, anything else from anybody here in the chat? Um, we can go back to football briefly, or maybe I will cut this off. I just want to do something, throw something at the wall. Obviously, tons of our coverage for the football, basketball, women's soccer now. We're going to NCAA tournament really about, I believe, about to kick off as I'm speaking here. Um, a lot else going on, and after the football season, we get fully into recruiting, and I got to tell you, I do think, certainly in terms of my colleagues in Pittsburgh that do actually cover West Virginia, we do, a, or really college sports at all, we do a lot more in terms of recruiting than a lot of others, and obviously there's recruiting competitors who do cover the Mountaineers. Uh, you know, I don't have to name them. You know who they are, but I think we do it better. And we're going to keep doing it better. And we got recruiting season coming up. So that's going to be a big deal. The signing days, what this recruiting class looks like. If you think these recruits do leave the program and decommit, Jaheim White keeps saying he's locked in, but he's locked in for the coaches. If they're not there, and he keeps mentioning Chad Scott in particular, you lose Brown, do you lose them all? Do you keep Brown because you want to keep these recruits? Do you lose Brown and keep the others because you want to keep these recruits? Do you care about recruiting because you should, and that should be part of your conversation? You lose all the recruits that right now are pretty solid. That puts you further behind the eight ball. But do they fit in system-wise with the new head coach? They got to think about that too. A lot of question marks. What do you think JT Daniels does? Got another year of eligibility. He could come back. He can go somewhere else. Do you want him back? Maybe you don't want him back, but honestly, then is he going to his fourth school in six years? He's certainly not going pro by any means. His draft stock plummeted. This year, do you go with Garrett Green to start next season, or do you want to go back in the portal again? Because Garrett Green looked really, really good against Oklahoma, but I got to temper a little bit the fact that Oklahoma is really, really bad, especially defensively, especially run defense-wise. He was the perfect guy to, you know, try to <clears throat> get by that Oklahoma defense, and he did. But does that keep on? There's a reason why maybe they have some concern over throwing, although he did throw a laser beam, a rope, 
to Bryce Ford Wheaton for that touchdown. So he, he was really, really good. But is that the Oklahoma defense? Is that him? Do you want him as the guy? If you do have him as the guy, does that then mean Nico's gone? Because that's we're not talking about a, a, a veteran there who has one or two years left. That's talking about you know a sophomore who's going to have plenty more years left if you're Garrett Green, you're, be, you're going to be the starter there. So Nico, who you brought in, I heard from some that he doesn't like this whole I'm going to sit for two or three years type of thing. He doesn't want to do that. So do you lose him then? Do you want to lose him? Or do you want to have him start? I don't think that's where I would want to go because then you're really risking it. He hasn't hardly played, obviously, besides the Townsend game. But still, where do you go? A lot of question marks will surround this football program after the season. Certainly recruiting is going to be a big part of that. What they do in the portal, do they go back in the portal to fix things quicker? And if Neil Brown's there, what's the rope? I wouldn't go more than one year, obviously, despite the extension. Fifth year, fourth year, really, already. Something got to give at some point. Who do you bring in, though? Because a lot of decisions are, are needing to be made before you fire a coach because it's a lot more complicated than an NFL team where you fire a coach and you lose recruits, you lose players to transfer. We've already seen a couple. You have a mass exodus again. It can put your program further back than it already is. Um, So, and again, Gavin, I still would love to know if you're a WVU fan or randomly a fan of another team, which could be possible here. And I don't care. You're certainly welcome here if you're not a Mountaineer fan. But it does not make sense to me how the coach who brought the program the greatest success it has ever had, unless you're maybe 19 years old and didn't really care about it or experience it, and who had a tournament win just a couple years ago, had a Sweet 16 run not that long ago, got a player that was his that's currently having NBA success in Javon Carter that no one predicted that to happen is now willing to go to the portal has brought better players into the portal and yeah last year sucked is totally on Huggins he certainly has said that that's a bad season obviously you lose seven games in a row multiple times in a year and don't make a tournament it's really really bad but there's reason to believe it'll be better this year despite a tough schedule that we talked about we'll see when they get to that schedule but Huggins is getting questions Huggins is certainly bringing players in. Perez should potentially be a real asset to this team that he'll he'll be there around conference play. He's not there right now. They will have tough games prior, but they'll eventually get him and it'll get better. So we will see when the season's over how to evaluate this, but a track record of success of 900-plus wins, a lot of them at your school, a Final Four, Sweet 16s, Elite Eight, deep tournament runs, the runner-up to Kansas – you know, again, it's not perfect. It's not Coach K resume, but he's also not out of blue blood. He's done this at West Virginia, Cincinnati before, and Kansas State before. And you just eventually wait him out. He'll retire, and then you go get somebody else who does not have the resume of Bob Huggins. But it's not like he's going to coach forever. You got to enjoy this now. A lot of kids, Eric Stevenson, Perez, they've said this. Even Perez, who hasn't played yet. They want to be there for Huggins. They want to learn under Huggins. So Huggins is not a problem. This this contingent of Mountaineer fans that hate Huggins, from what I've experienced, they're all like 21 years old or younger because they feel like the last three years have not been deep tournament runs and not a national title and maybe a little unreasonable. And if you don't have that in when they were really caring about the sport, then they don't care about the prior years, which is just crazy because you can do a Google search. You can know what happened. It doesn't discount it from his life or resume because you were too young. But again, it can't obviously be years and years in a row of missing the tournament. I'm sure he would tire if it was really, really that bad. Or maybe they would tell him, hey, go to pasture. But that I, I would this team could be good this year. We will see what happens. Right now they're playing well and they're winning big. But as he has said, which is true, they should be better. And I think him having tough love is what a lot of those players do like. Sean Butler likes it. John Flowers likes it. You can be the right fit for Huggins or not be the right fit for Huggins. If you're the right fit for Huggins, it'll work out. If you're not the right fit for Huggins, like say Oscar Chibwe was not, it won't work out. Okay? Not everyone can play under Huggins. 100%. I, I agree. That maybe is a negative. A lot of other, a lot of players can deal with Coach K. A lot of players can deal with Roy Williams. A lot of players can deal with this different play, with this different coach, that different coach. Not everyone can deal with Huggins. I get it. Jay Wright, a lot of players can play for him when he was, you know, doing it obviously at Villanova. Not everyone can do it for Huggins, okay? Huggins is a different personality. He's not going to change in that regard, and maybe that is a little bit of a negative in this day and age, but he has been willing enough to adapt to go to the portal, which I think is big and can help you quick the, quickly turn this around. Last thing maybe on Huggins before I do wrap this up here, Huggins had a bunch of selfish players the last couple of years. I think the players he has brought in 
even against lesser competition have shown they want to compete. That might be a fair point, actually. And I'm not going to say necessarily that they were selfish players in the past few years, but I don't know if they were Huggins guys. And he kind of alluded to that, that, hey, if these might not be my type of players, these might not be players that fit with me as well as others. So I think he, he, he kind of retooled things for a reason, honestly, just reading those tea leaves. And these players, you can't gauge how good they are against this competition so far. Certainly not against Morehead State or Pitt or Mount St. Mary's, even Bowling Green before. It will depend on conference play. It will depend on some out-of-conference games prior. It is a tough schedule, so they could be better than last year and still not be good enough and only have 16, 17 wins, and that wouldn't be good enough for the program. You should expect more than that, but they are much better already. They will get Perez. They will be better. Mitchell will get healthier, and Eric Stevens really has become this team leader regardless of who's the best player, and he's really good as well. So there's a mix of youth and talent and veterans there. A lot of players have had this experience there, which is good, but also experience elsewhere, which is good. And they really do feel like they respect Huggins and they do want to be there. You get that vibe from Eric Stevenson. You get that vibe from Trey Mitchell and others that they want to be there. They want to learn from Huggins and they respect him. And that's a, that's a positive thing right there. I don't know if that was the case the last few years. Um, so that's we it'll remain to be seen, but that's a positive right now so far in the Mountaineer basketball season. And we will learn a lot here in the coming weeks. We will learn if this football team can finish strong. We will learn if this football program is going to be led by a new head coach. We will learn where this athletic program is going to go in terms of an athletic director. We will learn what that means for the recruiting class, National Sign Day, and if they get other recruits or they get those recruits to become commits or they keep those commits or they keep those players on the roster and they don't transfer, or they get other players on the portal to come aboard, or we get the decision from JT Daniels, or what they want that decision to be, or who they want to be quarterback, and the decision then from Garrett Green or Nico. All of that is to come. I'm sure we will talk before that. In fact, we will talk many times prior to that. I will try to do more of these. And even if Gavin wants to keep on joining, and that's fine. He gets a little unreasonable with Bob Huggins takes, but hey, if we want to talk football, maybe yeah, Gavin will be a little more reasonable there, or whatever. Well, I don't care who joins this. Again, it's open to fans of, <laughs> of all of the teams that we cover or elsewhere, but certainly, obviously, this is a Mountaineer live chat for a reason. We can talk football. We can talk basketball. We can talk tiddlywinks if West Virginia competes in that, and who knows? They certainly have the ability to get it done throughout Olympic sports, so maybe. We'll talk the rifle team if you want. I throw those those <laughs> those posts up in the notebook occasionally. Again, WV Sports Now for our coverage of all of Mountaineer Athletics. Also at WV Sports Now on social, West Virginia Sports Now on Facebook, and myself there. If you do want to follow on Twitter at MikeOsti11, again, if Twitter still exists, I'll be there. If it doesn't, then find me somewhere else. But regardless, the website will be there, so you can go there for your coverage. And a lot, a lot, it's an understatement, of questions that are that are still needing to be answered to really know the future of not only the football program, which is the most important, the basketball program, really, and the athletic department. All of that we need to know. All of that remains to be seen. All of that will make more of this conversation more legitimate, but I still wanted to get one of these out there. It's been a while since I did one of these. Had a lot of going on in my personal life with my grandfather. And, hey, positive news. My baby now sleeps through the night. So thumbs up to that. Hope she keeps it up there. BPA, Mike, I am joining late. Do you think WVU football wins tomorrow? I'll give you that um, before we wrap this up. No. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not saying they can't, but I don't think they do. The reason why, even if JT Daniels plays well or Garrett Green plays well or whatever the case may be, and I'm going to give you a prediction right now because we're, we're not going to know until kickoff. So this, I guess this end part won't be evergreen as much. I like to keep these at least evergreen enough for a few days. I think JT Daniels starts, but Garrett green gets a heavy load of action, meaning it's similar to the game against Oklahoma. So I don't think while bowl eligibility still exists, maybe this will be different if they're out of bowl eligibility and they only have the possibility of five wins and they lose that game to KSU. I asked Brown about that. He wouldn't answer it, but he then kind of paused. So maybe then you sit JT, let him think about his future, and then you play Garrett, and Garrett just legit starts, and you have Nico come in a little bit for him against Oklahoma State on the road if they lose this game to Kansas State. If you win it, maybe you keep up what you're doing now. And going into this game, 
I do think they start JT Daniels. I don't think they, I mean, that really would be like a death note to his career in a way. I don't think they do that. I think Neil Brown's a little loyal in that regard, maybe too much, but he did come aboard. I don't think, I don't think they do it. I just don't. I don't think he pulls the trigger. I don't think he does it because think about it this way. If you want to play them both, and he did tell me, it's fair to say they're both going to play regardless of who starts. If you start Garrett Green, how are you going to get JT in that game? That doesn't seem to make sense to me. It doesn't seem like he's not a type of player that's going to spark you as a pocket passer, whereas Garrett Green could spark you as a dual threat. So I think the JT will start. You will see a lot of Garrett Green, if not switching off series. He certainly will come in. Whoever plays better will stay in. Maybe it'll be Garrett again. But Oklahoma was the only win this year where they were able to win despite losing the turnover margin. I don't know if that's been cleaned up. It hasn't been cleaned up really all year, no matter who's in. And I don't I don't see that happening again if they lose the turnover margin again. Deuce Vaughn could run all over the place, uh, also catch all over the place, and really do it on his own. Xavier Worthy did it on his own for Texas. When you have that one elite offensive threat on the opponent, they've done really well against West Virginia this year. That's, that would be a reason why I think Kansas State could win this game. They're going to be really, really hungry to have a chance of still being Big 12 champion, even though obviously TCU – is that team that's locked into the game and they're the favorite and they're undefeated and maybe a playoff team, but Kansas state is competitive. They've been competitive. They want to be in that game and they want to maybe beat them regardless of if that, you know, obviously that would screw the big 12 as far as the playoff. So they're a good team. They're not a great team, but they've been really good and really competitive. Most of this season, they maybe should even be better than their record. They have a really diamond in the rough already with over a thousand yards rushing and almost 500 yards receiving in again, Deuce Vaughn. Regardless of QB, he is that threat I don't think West Virginia has an answer for. I don't think their secondary has an answer for him. It's a lot of pressure on the D-line with Dante Stills. It's his last home game. Maybe he'll step up, but he stepped up in games and it hasn't mattered to the scoreboard. They've just been a roller coaster ride. You play really well, and then you dip. You play really well, and then you dip. You play poorly for a few weeks. You play really, really well, and then you dip. So it feels like they're going to dip. They just played well. They just won, and it feels like they're going to dip. So I... If they win, it'll make the Oklahoma State game very interesting because then the thought will be from the program even, if you win, you're just like a season ago. You didn't really dip record-wise. You will get a bowl game because six wins, major program. They're going to get in one. You have a chance to win that, getting over 500 if you do win that. That could really change the vibe. It'll show the teams playing for Neil Brown. I know a new AD would still maybe want somebody else, but that would be a nice sell job for Neil Brown, even though I think year four he should be better off than he is. And that might be what recruits want to see. That might give you a really new life for Garrett Green if he's the spark plug and leads you to those wins. Maybe then it'll sell you on him next year and you tell JT to go somewhere else. A lot could be decided possibly if you win those games, but I just don't see it. So I'm going to pick West Virginia to lose Kansas State. I want to keep it real. Um, but again, I do think for my prediction that JT will start, but I don't think he finishes. And I do think him and Garrett both see time in the game. I think Garrett Green has built in time in this game, but I do think JT starts just off my guess here. I have not been told. And Neil Brown's not going to tell anybody. So anybody who tells you he's told you didn't. There's there's no way Neil Brown has told anybody before this game. It would be stupid for him too, by the way. If he does, it's dumb. He shouldn't. There's, there's no reason to release this prior to the game. You keep it close to the vest. You make the opponent study for a dual threat too. They're two different types of quarterbacks. I agree with that call from Neil Brown, honestly. You, you keep it in. There's no benefit of him telling everyone. So anyone who says he told he told them, I don't believe it, but he also shouldn't have if he did. But no, he's not told me. I don't know. I'm thinking he's going to go JT and then Garrett and they both play, but I could be wrong. Garrett's been real exciting. I need more than one game to, to have me sold on him as the legit starter for years to come. I don't care what Pat White or Rashid Marshall want to say, and I respect them, obviously. Love Rashid. But if they're sold, great. I need more than one game to be sold. So we'll see if that happens. I think he plays regardless. I do think West Virginia loses, though. But if they win, it'll make that Oklahoma State game very, very intriguing, even though it's a game that all the best you can do is be 500. But it'll be a pretty freaking intriguing game for the best you can do is being 500. But they got to get through Kansas State first to make that happen. Will West Virginia be a basketball school again? Will Huggins usher in a new era and actually turn this thing around brought in transfers. It has a better roster. They want to play for him. The schedule's tough though. We will see. And what other program amongst West Virginia athletics <laughs> will be able to hoist a trophy or carry the flag for the athletic department. It wouldn't be positive though. You want it to be football, obviously, but the women's soccer team in the NCAA tournament, you got to give them respect there. The women's basketball team having a solid start to the year with a new era and new, co new coach. Got to give them respect there. We'll see. 
A lot of these questions will be answered here in weeks to come. I'll be back with more of these, though, until those get answered, and we'll just talk in circles again and really not have anything known um, either way. Um, next week will be a huge test for basketball team as well. We'll know a lot more about them after their tourney. 100% in Portland. That will be absolutely big. We will know more then. 100%. Although, to be fair, BPA, they still won't have Perez. I mean, that that's that's a great shooter, a great scorer that Huggins really, really wanted. You will not get him to conference play. You won't have him in that. That will definitely test you. But there is an argument that even through that, even if you're winning or losing, that you'll get Trey Mitchell healthier because he's only six weeks removed from surgery right now. And you will get Perez later on. You don't have him now. So the team should get better later on, regardless of that tournament. But that will certainly tell you a lot more than we currently know about the team. So that is fair.